Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for making your way up into the inner um, recesses of the Googleplex here. We're very pleased to host a, a true inventor in our midst, midst today uh, for Talks at Google. We actually have um, Brett Stern here. He's an industrial designer and inventor, currently living in Portland, Oregon. Um, so he has the whole Portlandia thing going on. Um, his contributions span a variety of industries, anything from the textile and pharmaceutical industries to consumer packaged goods, things like beer chips, which are actually quite amazing. Um, he speaks to us today about his new book, which is entitled Inventors at Work. In it, he profiles a series of inventors across industries, looks for commonalities, um, does some in-person in and phone interviews, and, uh, is cr and creates this book that is now a part of the At Work series, um, continuing the tradition of coders at work and, and so forth. Um, he, he, d he describes common threads and eureka moments from people like Steve Wozniak and the inventor of the Leatherman, which are both very near and dear to the tech work, tech work that we do here at Google. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Brett to the Google Buzz. So I am an industrial designer, and most people have no idea what that is. Uh, you go, they go to the store, they buy stuff, and they don't really think what's behind it. Uh, when I try to explain what an industrial designer is, there's a very sort of vague look in people's faces. And then I say, well, you know how an iPhone is designed so great? And they're like, yeah, we understand that. And then they say, well, did you design the iPhone? And then I have to say no, and they're sort of <laughs> upset. And, and so I've learned over years. Uh, and come to accept that I tell people now that I'm an inventor. And everyone knows when an inventor, they sort of have this romantic thoughts in their head of a, a lone guy in a garage, maybe crazy or maybe he's a genius, they don't really know, but sort of the working the late night oil and, and just sort of making something new to make the world a better place, make our lives easier and so forth. So uh, I do have that background. Uh, I am an industrial designer, though I sort of like to sort of step back and work on projects before you even know what the problem is. And that's sort of how I work the inventor side in. So uh, this project came along, the inventors at work. Uh, a Press, the publisher, I, they've done a number of books in this uh, series. And uh, so they just said, hey, go figure the book out. Work within the format we're doing, which is go out and find people within that industry, uh, interview them, whatever questions you want, and sort of edit these uh, conversations to do whatever you want. Uh, I, I read a great deal about inventors, about creative people, and the process and so forth. Uh, what I feel I'm able to uh, go from surgical instruments to potato chips easily because I understand the process of what it is to be a creative person and how to think broadly over that. And so my goal of this project was not to talk to these inventors about their products, which generally most stories talk about, but rather the process. So it wasn't about the product they were doing, but about the process that they go through every day. And the goal was, what I was trying to learn, and what I'm trying to convey to the reader, is what are those, are there commonalities? Are there certain traits that we inventive people, we creative people have inside of us that somehow, that makes us different from all the other kids on the block? And so going into it, I, I, I would sort of start this generic questions and try to sort of dial down and, and try to sort of seek what they were really thinking, how they think. And it's not so much thinking when they're behind their keyboard or their desk or their drawing board, but how they're thinking during the day, at night, when they're sleeping, when, when they're on top of a mountain, just how they think and, and what their process is to go from point A to point B. And so my presentation, is going to be sort of what I learned from doing this book and what these commonalities are and so forth. Now, when I started the book, I had carte blanche to just ask any, find any inventor that I wanted. And it's sort of like the dream list. And the reality is when you say inventors, like you know their inventions, but you don't really know the person, the inventor. I mean, we know Thomas Edison, we may know Steve Wozniak and a few other technical people, but we really don't know the person behind it. So. My process was, was to just sort of start with this empty slate uh, and sort of put down industries or technologies or products that I wanted to know. Obvious tech, uh, electronics, computers and things like that, transportation, medical, communication, uh, fun, uh, sports, materials, uh, whatever it was. And, and then my process was to go out there and find these people and do the process. And the process was just sort of going online and frankly Googling you know, the, the, the companies or the people that I wanted to do. Uh, and, and, and then sort of just continuously uh, research who these people were, 
uh, finding everything out there was about them, and then I would be interviewing them mostly on the phone, through Skype, through video conferencing, uh, putting all these document, uh, these conversations into uh, conversations, having them transcribed, uh, then editing them out, creating Word documents, uh, sitting in an ergon chair with my uh, noise-canceling headsets on. And while I was doing this, I just realized all the technology and all the inventions for, that allowed me to sit in a chair in my room all by myself to sort of find these people out there was just amazing. Uh, so they're, they're, the presentation will talk about these commonalities. All right. So dreaming. When I was young, I would go to sleep thinking about computer programs or computer hardware problems or math problems in school. Sleep and think and think as I fell asleep working the variables in my head, seeing the lines of code, and then I would wake up in the middle of the night sometimes and have a solution that would save one line of code in a program. So I believe very much that your mind is working while you're dreaming. Steve Wozniak, I mean, we all know who this guy was. Uh, and, and, and of all these tr traits, I think the biggest one that makes us unique as creative people is this dreaming. And somehow dreaming has a negative connotation in, in today's society, like you're, you're daydreaming, you're wandering off, you're not focused, you're, you're, you know, just pay attention here that you can't pay attention. But dreaming is just sort of essential. I mean, it's, it's somewhat of a childlike thing because we do it all as a child, and hopefully as an adult we can continue that in the process. So, this daydreaming or this dreaming is really a very important quality and this is I think out of all these traits is the one thing that you cannot be taught or educated or advanced. It's either in you and you allow it to happen or you don't and I, I think that's what makes us as creative inventor types different from the rest of the people out there. So pondering. I know that if I go to a seminar or a conference to hear someone talk, I'll drift off because the mechanism and the chemistry or the approach that they're talking about spurs an idea that might be useful in solving or addressing some of the problems I have. Even when it's not really what the guy or lady is talking about specifically, but something analogous to that. So uh, the pondering, this is Al Maurice. He's a, a polymer chemist at Dow Chemical. Uh, and what he developed was the polymers to go from oil-based paints to acrylic-based paints. Now, at a, if you're at a certain age, you, there was always oil-based paints. And if you went down to the garage, there was a, a coffee can with a stiff br brush in there all sort of stuck together. And if you walked into a room that was just painted with oil-based paints, you'd smell all the fumes and you'd get a headache or you'd drift off or something. Well, this guy figured out all the polymer chemistry. So he wasn't developing paint, but it was the thing to go into the thing to the thing. And so it was just so far removed, but his, his days were just mixing chemicals together to get to this final point. And so he'd been working literally on the same problem for the last 30 years to make uh, water-based paints. And the, the fun part of asking these people just general questions is I actually got to ask him the process. And he'd go, well, we'd mix all these things together. And uh, we'd basically put the paint out there, and then we'd watch it dry. And I was like, you actually got paid to watch paint dry. And, and so he really did get uh, paid to watch paint dry. Just fascinating. It just really um, used the process uh, of creativity to develop all these things. And what's interesting about also some of these people were from corporate people, some are academia, some governmental, some guys in the garage. Uh, Al works at uh, Dow Chemical, certainly a well-known company that uh, promotes technology and promotes innovation. Uh, what was interesting that there are companies out there, and I'm sure Google is very similar, that once you become uh, successful in what you're doing, you sort of go up the corporate ladder. But companies like Dow, companies like Corning, companies like IBM and GE, they allow their technical people to, to advance and go up the corporate ladder, but still stay, in a sense, in the lab doing their research. So they didn't have to become a manager. If they wanted to, they could do it. And I, I think Al, at some point, had become a manager. But really, he was managing the, the innovation, the creativity. But he is still in the lab every day, mixing things together. <laughs> To prospective inventors, I say rule one is perseverance. If you're working on an invention, at some point you are probably going to think about giving up and going on to something else. I realize there's a fine line between perseverance and failure to accept reality, but I recommend that you lean towards staying with it too long rather than giving it up too soon. That's Tim Leatherman, who happens to be in Portland, Oregon, who I interviewed in person. 
Uh, and so I'm sure everyone knows a Leatherman tool. There actually is a guy named Tim Leatherman behind Leatherman Tools, uh, and they actually have developed leather working tools, but no one ever buys them. Uh, so he was uh, trained as a mechanical engineer, traveled around in the early 70s uh, in Europe with his soon-to-be wife, uh, bought a car, uh, stayed in cheap hotels, and he was always fixing his car or fixing the plumbing in these cheap hotels traveling around Europe. Uh, and so he was always looking for pliers or screwdrivers or tools to sort of fix his daily routine. And so when he came back, even though he was trained as an engineer and actually worked, uh, when he got out of school in engineering, he decided he wanted to develop this multi-purpose tool uh, that has now become part of the vernacular and actually spent seven years in his garage from the time of making his first prototype to then actually commercialization. So here's a man for seven years just living, uh, he was not working, just going broke uh, trying to develop the Leatherman tool. Uh, and now his proudest achievement is actually not the tool, but they do all their manufacturing in Portland. So he has 300 people there in Portland making the thing. And so his greatest, he feels the greatest thing that he's done is actually employing 300 people to produce his product. Failure is a way of learning. What may be considered failures are actually other great ideas. Uh, anybody know Robert Denard? He invented RAM memory. I mean, memory, it's, it's what we all live on right now. He's 84 years old, he's a senior fellow at IBM, still in there every day working. It's pretty amazing. Uh, now, when you invent something, there's always sort of this prior art, sort of what someone did beforehand. And what was fascinating talking to Bob was what he did, there really was nothing before there. Everything was a bunch of tubes and vacuums and so forth. So he really is the first one who created something new, which is just such a rarity these days. Uh, and, and, and I think one of the things we get hung up as people, as a society, is failure is a bad thing. But failure is such a great thing. It's you learn what you, what's not working for that particular problem, but you have that experience and you can go on to and apply that knowledge to something else at a, at a future point. Self-motivation. You know, when there's a certain joy to what you do and when you have, a, th have this certain energy, it's what makes me happy. Doing these things made me happy. That was the real motivation. It made me happy. So Gary Mickelson is a spinal surgeon. Uh, and just to give you an idea how successful he was, he sold all his patents, about 250 in 2005, for $1.4 billion. Uh, totally changed the way everything did. Uh, what was interesting, uh, and here's a man who was totally successful in what he's doing, but totally insecure uh, about was he ever really successful in doing this. And he said every time he would create something and when he was a resident, all the doctors would say, don't do that, you're wrong, you're stupid, do it my way that I've always done it before. And the biggest thing he said that the doctors told him before, well, the biggest reservation they had is like, don't kill anybody. And so, you know, when we invent something, we think, oh, well, you know, that program won't work or that toy won't work, or whatever. Well, he was actually, he could paralyze people or kill people. So it's just fascinating that he really changed the whole subject matter and the whole range of uh, medical procedures. Seek inspiration. Uh, outside your field. Solutions kind of flash into your brain at some point. I can't really explain what my subconscious activity is, especially these days. I, I like to spend a lot of my time on my farm pushing rocks around with my tractor. It's a background process or, sub or subconscious process I really cannot explain. Usually it's related to having a problem that I want to solve. I don't sit back and dream up solutions to things that don't have a problem yet, but when faced with a problem, usually the solutions in my field at least come pretty quickly. I can't give you a recipe for invention. That's impossible. So Eric was a physicist. He was a professor at Columbia doing research, uh, and then in the early 80s got uh, brought out to uh, Jet Propulsion Labs to work on satellite camera systems. At the time, they were all film-based and used big, heavy batteries, and they were shooting two or three satellites up, and they needed to record everything. What he developed was a digital camera. Every uh, digital camera on your phone now is stuff that he developed. And so he did this back in the 80s. He said, you know, when we talked to him in this day and age, I said, did you ever think you know, 30 years later, 20 years later, that every phone, forget that it would have cell phones, but every camera, would be, every phone would have a camera. And it was just, you know, he's still de redeveloping this technology today. And just, you know, now they're on cameras, but he's saying eventually you're going to be swallowing these cameras and looking inside of you and taking pictures, which their researchers are doing already. So it's just fascinating. I was just curious, um, was the camera, did it come from an inspiration outside of what he was working on?
Uh, you know, that I, I don't really know where he found that inspiration from. That's a, it's a good question. But I, I think the, the, what he was sort of saying there that uh, because he was a physicist, he didn't approach this as a camera solution or as a film solution. He was just looking out something else outside of, his, outside of the, the typical field. And I think a lot of the uh, people uh, that I interviewed sort of found solutions in, in other venues. Sharing ideas with others. Motivating a group to be creative is not difficult. I believe that sharing ideas is a secret to developing new concepts. If you can create an atmosphere of honestly sharing whatever comes to your mind, I don't care how brilliant you are or how slow thinking anybody is, if they are willing to open up and let whatever they say or think come to the floor and share with everyone else, even if it's the stupidest idea and they know it's stupid when they say it, it often leads to, some, leads to something. When you get two, three, or four people together in a room and you just open up and say whatever you're thinking, good things will happen. So Ryan Gruner, the Nerf ball. I mean, we'll, it's the Nerf ball. I mean, this is the other extreme of, uh, of what invention is all about. And what the guy invented before the Nerf ball, because it was all about playing, he invented the twister game. And I think that's actually even a, a more amazing thing because, back, and it's pretty dated, but back in the mid 60s when he developed this, you know, society was much more restrained and conservative, but basically Twister opened up where people could actually touch each other and physically interact with each other, really changing the social dynamics of society and something what he was doing. So able to visualize ideas in their heads. I visualize in three dimensions what the products look like, and being such a hands-on builder of products, I like to very quickly get to, into the three-dimensional form. I spend half an hour on a simple sketch and get right into trying to build something, either carving out of foam with a rasp or building Bondo onto the onto a last shape. Uh, Martin Keene with Keene Footwear. Anybody know Keene Footwear? So totally changed how shoes look, but really changed how shoes feel. I mean, basically, so he's an industrial designer also. So very hands-on type of guy as, as I am. So before, the way shoes were designed, where the, the factory would have the last, which is the shoe shape, they would give it to the designer, and they would, this generic shape of all different sizes, and they would just sort of design around the shoe last. What he did, he actually went out and cast people's feet. Now, it sounds so obvious to do something like that, but the designers never really had that option before to be that hands-on. And because of that, if you've ever worn Keen footwear, uh, they really fit a lot better. Uh, and they're really comfortable. And now, if you look at the way shoes are, the, the, certainly the toe shape, they really have changed because of what he's put in there. A touch of obsession. I saw Star Wars on the big screen when I was 11. It was 1977, and I fell in love with R2-D2. If you've seen Star Wars, you know that, that R2-D2 is more than a machine. He has a personality, he has an agenda, and he is one of the main characters. It was the first time I saw potentially what a machine could be. Now we're not there yet, but my motivation is R2-D2. So this is Helen Greiner. Uh, the company she had at the time was iRobot. And uh, consumer-wise, you may know of the Roomba robot that sort of goes around your apartment to clean it up. But really what they made their money for, and really the technology developed, were all the robots that are in Iran and Iraq to disassemble bombs out there. Uh, just an amazing thing what they're doing. Uh, and just uh, and a brilliant woman uh, from MIT and just really changed the way of what machines could think and how they could see and they could move. And, and this is just all what she's thinking about all day. So the neat thing about 3M is that we have experts in just about every field that you could possibly imagine. We've all got these people who are willing to help, but you need to take advantage of it. Matthew Schultz. So he's a researcher at 3M. Has anybody ever broken their arm and had a cast? All right, all those casts, that's this guy. If anybody has ever had an operation and they put this film on your body for antimicrobial where it sort of separates, that's this guy over there. Completely different things, but what, what's important to him is that he didn't necessarily know all the ideas and all the solutions, but he was able to go out into his surrounding force and ask a lot of questions to find the experts. And I'm sure each one of you are experts with your own things, but sometimes you don't really know. And so the commonality here was just continuously ask questions to people. Work in multidisciplinary teams. I only work with teams of people with a variety of different backgrounds, engineers, scientists, biologists, nutritional scientists. In order for an initiative to be successfully impactful, each person of a team is critical and the one person alone won't be able to do it. The initial technical area or original concept might be one person's contribution, but it will need to be reduced to practice in the lab, scaled up, utility tested, and vetted. Uh, Bernard works right now at General Mills. I assume you all eat cereal, dried cereal in the morning. 
Well, all those little marshmallow shapes, or all those little round donuts and everything, this is what this guy developed. So he was trained as a food scientist, but when I got out of school back in the, in the late 60s, there were all these new extrusion machines that were coming about. And he actually got a job working for this company uh, to promote this machine and sense sell the machine with this food background. So he went into the marketplace and trained all these people how to use this as extrusions machines. So now all the dried cereals and crackers and, and flatbreads that you eat because of this guy over here. Continuous learning. I think, uh, I think you try to look for colleagues who you can learn from stuff from and you always have to be learning stuff from different people. So Karen is a scientist at the Naval Research Labs. I'm assuming you people know of DARPA. Well, the Naval Research Labs is similar that they're doing work. Uh, she re her current project is she's developed this fuel cell that can have a drone fly for 24 hours just in hydrogen. So you can imagine the implications. And it's not a, a big plane, but it's still something that is elevated for, for 24 hours. The concept is that uh, uh, aircraft and boats and eventually cars could run on these fuel cells out there. Now she is a, a chemist and a brilliant woman, but she is working with all these uh, just PhD people out there that she can go and put these teams together uh, and continuously find new solutions to problems. Work on multiple projects. Our teams are working on many separate projects simultaneously. It does create a din of discussions that sometimes hard to separate, but I do find that working on them simultaneously forces synergies. Inventors and innovators usually have very busy minds to try to keep the, ourselves focused on one thing becomes a challenge. We try to make sure we have outlets for multiple tracks of thought, whether they are personal projects that we are doing outside of work or multiple internal projects that we are working on. This multitask approach keeps the ideas flowing. So these three gentlemen are also industrial design and designers. They're at Motorola Solutions, and they're working on police communications, you know, the, where the police or have their radios on their side, or the FedEx guy, the UPS guys. Uh, and, and they were just fascinating because they really get out there into the marketplace and really see how people think and work. And their goal is really to come up with solutions, not their solutions, but really going into the marketplace and asking the marketplace what the solutions are. Uh, and I, but what was fascinating is that these guys are working, and a lot of these people I talked to were working on 5, 10, 15 projects at a time. And I, I think that's important, I know personally, is because you start a project and you're all excited and you have all this energy and you ramp up this, 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 this thoughts uh, and then there's, there's time lags. You sort of have to put projects on hold and I think the idea of working on multiple projects gives you that opportunity to sort of go up and down in your, in your cycle and working on these things. To ask lots of questions, to a large degree, we want to have a good understanding of what the problem is that we're trying to solve because scientists have great ideas and there's never a shortage of that. I think the key way that we approach research, certainly on more applied programs, is that we want to get aligned with the right problems. I think it's fair to say that a lot of the biggest challenges in doing innovation is track, tr tackling or asking the right question, identifying the right problem. Uh, so Glenn is at General Electric. Uh, they're developing these hybrid batteries for locomotives to eventually run on batteries, not uh, diesel fuel anymore. Um, what was interesting about uh, Glenn is that he works at General Electric, and if you look at the inventing process, and if you look at the king of inventor, that's Thomas Edison, uh, just one thing he said to me, when they walk into the door, Thomas Edison's desk is right there. And just that heritage sort of just strove these people for perfection and just keep pushing themselves. So, and, and to really say what's out there. Uh, also, General Electric was really probably the first R&D lab, so it went from being the lone crazy guy in the garage to setting up in a corporate atmosphere, in a sense, where you are today. Prototype quickly. Yes, I'm going to stick my finger into a moving table saw blade. Your whole life you have to be been told not to do that. Your body is telling you, no, don't do this. This is stupid. Uh, so and I don't know if anybody's heard of a saw stop table saw or ever seen a demonstration or have any done wood, has anybody done woodworking before? And so you know that blade is spinning really fast and your fingers are getting really close. So he's developed a saw that when it comes into contact with any part of the body will stop in like a ten thousandth of a second and will not cut your finger off. What was interesting is that the industry has for been years sort of acknowledging the problem but sort of putting a guard on that they know everyone will take off because it just gets in the way. But since no one had solved the problem, that was the solution. Everyone said just be careful, wear your safety goggles. Uh, his background was actually has a PhD in physics uh, but didn't want to teach so went back to school to become a patent attorney. 
uh, and then was sort of was doing woodworking on the side and then realized like, well, here's a problem here. Uh, and when I was explaining, when he was explaining the process to me, he, he didn't look at this from a mechanical standpoint at all. He just looked at it, he's a physicist and he, and he just had these, uh, he had these facts in his head that because I'm a physicist, I know this, this, and this, and of course it should work. And so we had this whole discussion, and, and literally in a half hour, he said he prototyped this thing. And then I said, well, you know, how did you decide to test this? And he goes, well, the first one is we used a, a hot dog, you know, and it worked. And I said, but then I'm obligated to stick my finger into this thing, which is, I, I can't really imagine that because I do woodworking too. So we had this, I mean, the, the conversation sort of branched out. Like, I wasn't asking questions. I just wanted to know. Like, which finger did you use to stick your <laughs> in any? And so we talked about it, and he goes, well, I'm right-handed, so it's going to be my left hand. And he says, I need my thumb and my pinky because you don't want to keep hitting those, and you need your sort of mid your pointer finger to sort of do stuff with, you know. And, and then I said, well, you need this finger because it's the most important thing. And he goes, yeah. So he, so he actually chose his ring finger, and as a pure engineer, it's like he didn't really need his wedding band, even though he's married. It didn't really matter if he cut that finger off. So he actually did st stick his mid his uh, ring finger in to the table saw and it did work uh, and now they control 80% of the market and turned down by the whole industry uh, but uh, really controlling it now. Physical exercise. Research proves the role of exercise in keeping your brain vital. I do all sorts of cardio exercise. I have advanced arthritis in one hip but I just went out and ran four miles. Obsessive personalities such as mine help in maintaining these pursuits. I like to think that my obsessions are synergistic. When I go and run like crazy, I come back and feel my, my body and brain are all oxygenated and ready to work. So uh, Bob works at Xerox. I assume you've all used the Xerox machine. His optical printing is what runs all these machines. Uh, and it's just fascinating. And I think uh, all you people look in pretty good shape. You're riding bikes, you're running, you're hiking mountains. And we all know we sort of get that endorphin rush when we're out there doing something. And I know personally, because I do a lot of cycling, that when, when I'm on my bike, I do some of my best thinking, which is somewhat contradictory. I should be doing my best thinking when I'm sitting down on front of a piece of paper. But somehow when your body is sort of had this relaxation process, you get into this zone. And, and so these guys feel that physical exercise is good. Never retire from inventing. Uh, so Kevin thinks maybe when he's dead, he's going to retire. So he's a research mechanical engineer at, at Monsanto. And whatever you want to think about Monsanto, that's a whole other discussion. Uh, so what he's figured out is a machine to actually read the DNA of a seed before it's planted. So it's taking a tiny little scraping off of the seed, and then we'll figure out how to read it in a very quick automated process. And so I asked him, like, well, how do you think? Like, how did you come up with this idea? He goes, well, my office is in St. Louis. The fields are in Iowa. It's a five or six hour drive going. You know, I have to go out there once a month. I'm driving five or six hours by myself. And I said, I picture myself as the seed. I'm in the ground and the dirt's above me and the sun's above me and the rain's coming down. And I say to myself, if I was a seed, what I would want to be. And it's just the focus and the concentration was just, was really good. And I think, you know, sometimes you have to see the big picture but you know, here he is just getting really small uh, and really looking at what he was doing. And, and, and he said to me, he's like, I get paid. I don't even know what I get paid. I, my check gets deposited, but I have enough money, that's, and I just want to keep doing this forever. Uh, it was also interesting, like this guy, originally he was in the Army, went back to school after, went to community college, took some engineering classes, uh, and then eventually went back to school again. And so some of these people, uh, just were self-trained people, some community college people, some are MIT uh, trained, some have advanced degrees, so it's all facets. Making money. If you make no money with your invention, basically you really failed in the real world. And this was Ron Popeil. I'm sure you guys have seen Ron Popeil on TV selling his chopper mattock or his pocket fisherman. Uh, so he's still alive there doing, and he's actually he's been retired. He sold his company a number of years ago, uh, and he has a new uh, kitchen turkey fryer that the whole time while I'm interviewing is trying to sell me his turkey fryer, uh, which was really interesting. Um, 
but and he's he and it was he, he cooks everything, so it was just making it sound so good. Uh, he he goes to the other extreme, so his whole validation is on money, and I thought that was really interesting because all these other people, their validation was on the success of their project, the invention, and it helped society. And and he looked at it as like, well, if everyone's giving me money, they're all using my product, and they're getting the advantage of that. Though he never really looked at the quality of what he was doing, he just looked at the quantity he was doing. But I, I think he it was just fascinating listening to the other extreme of what's out there. And so patents, so, so I interviewed 22, 23 people, uh, 23 chapters I should say, some were multiple people, 22 of them were inventors, uh, and the last two, Elizabeth and John, were uh, assistant commissioners at the patent office. Uh, and I wanted to know really about sort of the question about patents, because that's really, IP is really important to all of us, whether it's hardware or software. Uh, and they're, they're, these two people are working now, working with individual inventors and small businesses. Throughout our history, people have come to America looking for the freedom and opportunity to be independent, create something on their own, and claim a piece of the universe. This quest has driven our success as a nation. Our office aims to make inventors realize that there is an assistance here for them as they begin their innovative journey. I mean, what's great about this country and what has made this country is innovation, that we have this freedom. And the biggest freedom, I think, is, is that you could fail. You can make a zillion mistakes, but yet if you achieve, you could be rewarded for those things. And you have that ability there. And so the patent office, and everyone has a different opinion on that, what the good and bad of patents, and I know everyone is fighting in the courts right now, uh, but patents, uh, these guys are at least there to help protect the small business. So if you guys do have ideas, you don't have to uh, hire attorneys. You could do it pro se. They're having new programs that they're establishing all over the country for local community colleges to help people submit a patent pro se, which is meaning submitting it yourself. So some of the things that I've learned just in my career as an inventor, you know, we're fascinated. We have to do something new. And, and personally, that's a lot of pressure to put on yourself doing that. So I think the only thing, the way I've come to terms with that, the only thing that was ever new was the wheel, the hammer, and the, uh, the process of making fire. And if you have those three variables, heat pressure and time, and from those heat pressure and time, you could create anything after that. So I, I never really looked that I'm doing something new. What I think I'm doing is trying to sort of modify stuff and try to sort of see what was done before and what is the next step because in, after I'm long and gone, there's going to be someone after me to take, he's going to look at what I did and do the next generation of stuff. So there's, I, I also think it's a challenge when you do, when you think something is new, people really won't get it. I mean, there's always the first adopters, but that's a very small percentage. So I think it's important to to understand and pay homage to what someone did before and go to the next step, but never think that it's going to be so different that it, it's, it's never been done before because everything has been done. Uh, and so what does it mean to be creative? And to, to me, you know, I think society says that you could draw pretty pictures, you could play an instrument, or you can act, or whatever it may be. But to me, creativity is all about problem solving. It's that simple. That's the definition. It's just problem solving. And it's important, I think, as the guy from uh, Glenn from General Electric said, it's important to really define what the problem is that you're going to solve and then go back and make sure there's an equal sign. So innovation, a uh, big buzzword right now. And, and as compared to what is invention or innovation. So to me, innovation is, is the commercialization of that idea. It's not the idea, it's just the, 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 how you get it out there into the marketplace, the marketing of it. And the invention side is the understanding and the reinterpretation of scientific or technical data. And, if, and so if you're inventing something, you really have to understand how it works, how it's made, the materials, and so forth. Uh, this is just sort of a, a, a personal thing. Uh, to be an innovative person, to be an inventive person, to be a creative person, you need to be flexible, whether that's uh, intellectually, emotionally, physically. Uh, you just need to be adaptable all the time. So you may have sort of a solution, and you go down that road, and it may not work, but you need to be able to adapt, continue to say, oh, I could change. And I, I think that's just, as you get older, it becomes harder to change. And so you have to sort of resist uh, all that and continuously be flexible. This is something that I, I am, you know, they're adrenaline junkies. I'm an experienced junkie. And so I don't, I've jumped out of a plane, but I don't need to do it again. Uh, but I just love having different experiences. And sometimes it's just eating a meal that I've never, eating a food that I've never had before. But it's just all these experiences add up to opportunities and situations that you could reference from. And, and, and this is time I've come to know that it doesn't matter 
how smart you are or how much money you have, this is the only thing in the world that is limited and you cannot create more of. No one will ever create more time, so use it wisely. I mean, it's important to look long, long term down the road, but as uh, John Maynard Keene said, in the long term, you're dead, and that will happen eventually. And so use your time wisely and really focus on what you're doing at the moment. Uh, if you're putting stuff out there, I'm sure you guys think about this all the time, telling a good story. You want people to buy into what you're doing. And uh, so I, I have actually put products out on my own, which is a lot different than inventing something and handing it off to the client or, or your, your boss or something. And to me, being an entrepreneur is just whatever it is, it's taking full responsibility for everything. If there's a, a, a hurricane on the East Coast, it's your responsibility if you're trying to get your product there. If, if your uh, employee doesn't deliver, it's your responsibility. So being an entrepreneur means taking full responsibility for everything. And so uh, this is something that uh, a lot of beers, I've come up with this quote, uh, man climbs a mountain because it's there, man invents something because it's not there. And this is just sort of something in your gut. It's like, I'm gonna do this because it's never been done. Like, I don't know why, it's just some people like doing this and, and I have that and all these other people have that. So that's my presentation. Uh, I hope we have some questions now. So, so the question is, how do ethics get involved? Yeah, to what extent is, it, is an inventor responsible for creating the ethical implications of technology? I, I would say, and I'm going to speak for myself now, I, th I do what I do because my parents gave me certain values and ethics. And I'm committed to making the world a better place in a positive way. And that's just me personally. And the things I'm trying to do, I think, are helping the world. And you know, when I do a surgical instrument, you know, you could, th those things came in front of me all day. Like, are you extending someone's life to be good or should they just die? And, and these were issues that faced. It, it's a challenge, I don't know. I, I, I don't really have an answer. I, I think you, you have to think of them and I think you have to just personally say to yourself, do I feel comfortable putting this out there in the marketplace? That being said, when you give someone a tool, whether it's digital or analog, you have no control over how they're going to use it. So, and to not put it out there, to prevent it out there, I mean, it's sort of like once you open up that box, it's out there. Uh, you have no control over it. And, and things, good things can be used for bad. I, I don't have an answer. I, I think it's just on a case-by-case -case basis. You have to feel comfortable with yourself that there, you can't live in a pure world. I mean, it, it, we're, we're, it's just not pure anymore. It's, you just have to put it out there, do your best, and hopefully it'll be used for the good of man. And, and that's the best answer I can give. Uh, so you were asking me about what is innovation and why is it always commercialization based. Uh, I think you could invent something and not commercialize on it, not bring it to the marketplace. You can have it sit in your garage and that's fine. It's your decision. I, I think the reason I wanted to give that definition is because I think the term inventing, invention, creativity, innovative, they're just terms thrown out there all day. And hanging out with like-minded people, we're in bars and we're discussing our projects and it always comes up and it's like, well, I'm creative and I'm innovative. Well, is it the same thing? And what are the subtleties, differences? And so I just made a definition up for myself to sort of say, oh, when I'm doing projects, I'm doing the invention now, and now I'm doing the innovation. And you're wearing separate hats, because when you're doing the invention side, you're wearing the technical, say, engineering design hat. But when you, I feel when you're doing, wearing the innovation hat, you're wearing the marketing and the business side. And it was just made me feel comfortable to understand that they're two separate things, because as a designer, everything is all about compromise. And so when you're doing art, there's no compromise. It's just what you're doing for yourself. When you do design, it's compromising things. And I, I think when you're doing the innovation side, you're not doing the, the invention side is done already. And it's you're trying to get it out there. And, and frankly, I want people to give me money for the things. I mean, you guys want people to give you money for the things too, whether it's directly or indirectly. And you create situations where people give you money for your things. And that's separate. You don't ask the same people who are thinking of the technology side to figure out ways to give you money side. You, you, you purposely separate those two. And you have to wear two different hats because they're two different methods. 
So that's why I personally, just me personally, this is again, it's my definition, is I'm able to separate that. It's like, okay, I've done the invention side, now I'm gonna go out and make some money doing it. And, and frankly, I like to be compensated for my work. You know, I think it's fair, just as everyone else gets compensated. It's a, you know, so I, I realize that I, uh, when I'm the inventing side, I'm, I'm sort of looking very close down into my, you know, I'm looking down at the drawing board, and when I'm doing the innovation side, I, I'm sort of looking at the world out there. I'm saying, hello, can you hear me? So that, that's, that's where I feel comfortable. Okay. So what tips would I share uh, as an inventor? Well, for, I had the option of interviewing myself because some of the other At Work books, they did exactly that. I thought it was surreal uh, to sort of do that. Um, and I felt maybe when I did this project, I wanted, I, I think I was looking for validation, like I've been doing this for 25 years, have I learned anything? And so these are the, the masters and everything, so I felt I was giving reverence to them. And when I got to the end of it, so all these things, all those uh, skills, skill sets, I have all those. So I felt pretty good about myself. So as, as far as, so I feel yes, I'm an inventor, I could get to wear the inventor hat, whether I have patents enough, or not, I'm still an inventor. I've made money on my inventions. So, you know, if you get a patent, are you an inventor? If you make money, are you an inventor? I don't know. I've done both those things. So what have I learned? I, I've learned all those things on there. And, and I learned it's a lifestyle. It's something that you're, you're born with and can be nurtured. Uh, but it's also something you have to live with 24-7, that you just can't really turn it off. And I think most professions, some professions, that you could go in at 9 o'clock in the morning, hit the time clock, and at 5, come home and, you know, go, go out with your buddies and watch the game, whatever, and you could sort of turn your brain off. This, and this is for all creative people, you have to, it's, it's a life thing. It's a 24-7 thing. And so uh, that's the best thing I could say as an, to a young inventor, because I have these conversations, it's like, accept it. Just, you're weird, you think different than all the other kids on the block, this is how you are. You know, try to be around with like-minded people that don't think you're so weird and crazy, that you're thinking all the time, uh, but it's okay to think this way. And so, and it's really quite fun after a while, you know? I mean, it's like, I get to, I, I've made it through life so far without ever having a job. I've worked since I'm 14, somehow in the creative industries, but I've never had a job. And, I, and that to me, that I could say that to other people, like you can make a living doing this. And it's not really a living. I mean, I, whatever money I make, I blow it on the next project. And, and that's really important to me. So I never get comfortable. I live a very simple life. I have a very low carbon footprint. And I'm, you know, I'm a single guy. I could take everything that I've made and just blow it on the next thing. The worst that can happen is I could fail and I'll lose money. I'm not going to do anything wrong or unethical or illegal. I know that. I'm not going to be put in jail. I pay my taxes like everyone else. I have health insurance. But you could have this life and, and live this way. You know, and it's great. And you could work in a corporate setting, as a, as a consulting setting, or as an entrepreneurial setting, whatever it may be. So, you know, go forth and prosper. It's possible. And this is, this is I, I think, with all the turmoil we have today, whether in the world or in our country, for whatever reasons, this is such a great time to live because whatever worked yesterday is not working tomorrow. And, and I mean, it, it's just amazing. So, and it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, what education you have. It's like, there's always a way to get some money to do something, whatever way it is. I mean, whether it's from your parents or a credit card or VC, whatever, there's Kickstarter, there's ways to get money to fund these projects, to you know, just go into the garage and make something. Whatever, whether it's digital, analog, this is the most amazing time to live right now with all the tools that you guys provide out there into the marketplace and all the, the technology and tools that these former guys have developed and offered to our society. I mean, it's just, it's so exciting right now with all the materials, and the technologies, and, and, and just things to try. And, you know, it doesn't have to be fiber optics. You know, it doesn't have to be RAM memory. It could be a, a new bike light, you know, something like that. When the inventors created their projects, were they also thinking of the innovation side? Great question, and I would say most of the people I interviewed were in a corporate or governmental or educational setting. And so, especially in the corporate setting, you have all these people out there to do certain roles, and their job was to do the invention side. They would talk with the marketing side and the sales side 
continuously, and the, the, especially nowadays, where the people are all brought in. In fact, they're talking, they're bringing the manufacturing people in. They're bring, you know, they're bringing everyone in right from the beginning. But I would say the actual inventors don't really have, on a corporate setting, involvement in the innovation side. Tim Leatherman, as an example, because he was the crazy guy in the garage, he was out there selling it. But he was probably the wrong guy to do that because he was too close to it. And so most inventors are not very good sellers of their ideas because they're, they're too wonky, you know, and they don't really understand the, the marketing side or the selling side of it. So you have to be really careful. So I say, in, in a sense, to really get stuff out there, systems have to be in place to, do, to separate the, the tasks. So the question is, how do you sort of not think so much about the invention, but the getting it out there into the marketplace? Or almost how do you avoid knowledge silos that end up happening? Uh, you know, I think you need to just be a well-rounded person. And, and that's a challenge because, you know, technical people, especially engineers, are really focused. I mean, their whole life has been getting into tiny little minutiae details. And, and I think that's... That's a challenge for people. I, I think you just have to, uh, you know, network into your friends and see, you know, go hike a mountain and look at the world. You know, go out there and just see the world. And, and I think a lot of technical people just are marveling at the technology and just saying, "Gee whiz, this is a great thing that I'm doing." And, and in fact, never really want to finish it. You know, it's like, "Oh, I can make it better." You know, like 2.0, 2.5, 3. You know, I mean, it's always going to be something better. And so that's what I was saying, like new versus modify. It's like, you know, there's a point, you know, it's interesting because the computer industry will just put stuff out there and like say, and then next year there's going to be a, the upgraded version of that as compared to in, and even like look at cars. Every year there's a new, there's the 2013 coming out. And, and so I, I think that's just nature is that you have to, at some point, well, this is the way I look at it, it's like, you give birth to your children and you give them certain values and morals and education and then you say, okay, go off to college, you know, and then you could like sort of have control of them, you know, because you give them money or something, but you know, you don't really have that much control. And so there's a point where you just have to put it out there whether it's ready or not and then learn from that experience. You know, if, was it too soon? Was it too late? Did I wait too long? Sometimes waiting too long is a bad thing. Sometimes it's it's too soon, you put it out there and it gets a crappy review and it's sunk. You know, you're screwed at that point. So there's that real fine line. And so you could have a solution and it could be, it could be successful or failure based on timing, and, and based on the marketplace, based on world events, based on politics, based on, you know, the, the, the envi physical environment. I don't know. I mean, I, I know all this stuff, but I know nothing. You know, it's like there's no predictability in any of this. There's no, like, oh, if I do this, this will happen. You know, every time is completely different. And every time I think I learn something, it's like, I don't know. I mean, the more I learn, it's like the less I know. I mean, it's, it's such a true proverb right now, but it's great to keep learning stuff. And, and you just have to keep trying. And I think some people become successful when they sort of do the same thing over and over again. They sort of stay within that industry or same, you know, that product line or something. Uh, I don't do that. That's my fault. It's, um, you know, I get screwed by like learning new stuff all the time, you know and learning new experiences, but that's my thing, you know, and I'm willing to, to accept that. That's okay for me. You know, I like doing that. You know, and it's like because it's like the money, I'm just gonna blow it on another idea. It's okay, and I, somehow I can make money and just blow on another idea. I'm, you know, right now I'm working on a bicycle tire project. You know, it's fascinating. I, I've, I've learned everything there is about bicycle tires. You know, and, and I'm a cyclist, and I've never done bike projects before, and I love riding, so. So where do I find knowledge, or how do I yeah. direct it? Well. First, you can't rush anything. Uh, I mean, I mean, I was doing. Med I was in a think tank uh, consulting for Pfizer for five years, doing med surgical instruments and medical implants for seven years. Excuse me. They hired me because I knew nothing about it. They wanted that out of the box thinking. You know, they they brought a doctor in to like, okay, this is how we do uh, angioplasty surgery, and the next project would be this is how we do hip implants, and it's like, you know, okay. Uh, but my job in those situations at least, is to say, what if? Now, it wasn't my job to be a doctor, it wasn't my job to be a mechanical engineer, a biomechanical engineer, it was my job to say, why are you doing that way? Uh, we went to Japan to do uh, orthopedics for the uh, Asian market. The first night we were there, we were sitting on the floor in the restaurant drinking beers. 
And I said, do you guys design these implants for people to sit on the floors? And we were all the Americans in, in Japan. It's like, we never, who sits on floors in America? You know, so my job was, and that was it. I, I was like, my job was done. Drinking a beer, I said, you know, do you sit on a floor? And it's like, no, well, let's, you know, let's design the implants for people to have increased range of motion is really what it was all about. You know, and then looking at the physiology of the body. I didn't have to come up with a solution. That's not, I'm like so far in the front of it. You know, there are all these people like behind, and I think it's, you need all those experts to be in the room. I mean, are you personally responsible for putting something out there into the marketplace right now here at Google? You're not. You have all these teams of people that you work on. And, and I think uh, the problem inventors have is when they think they know everything or they want to learn everything, and what happens is they do get bogged down and they like, oh, I have to go back to school to become a physicist. Oh, I have to go you know, get my engineering degree. It's like, no, you could just hire an engineer to do that. I mean, I hire people all the time. You know, I, I mean, I'm an industrial designer. I don't do any mechanical drawing anymore. There, there's, you know, young people out there that I could hire, you know, to do this in 15 minutes or an hour. I don't have to learn all these CAD drawings anymore. I could say, I want this, you know. I give them a sketch and it's like a back of a napkin. It works fine. So you, work, you find experts and that's how you become the expert. And, but it's important for you to continue to ask them those questions. Like, why are you doing that? What, you know, what are the three variables? And if they, give you, if they give you something back and say, okay, here's the solution, it's like, why? Can we, you know, can we do it some other way? Can, and that's what the out-of-the-box thinking is. It's like, why are you doing this? And asking this question. So ask questions continuously. You know? And it, there's, there's nothing wrong with a question. People may get pissed at you because they may not know the answer. That's when people get annoyed when they don't know the answers and they're supposed to be the experts. And then you just find a different expert. So just keep asking questions. Well, on that note, those are some great questions and a great presentation. Thanks Thank you. a lot for presenting with us.